I'm now going to introduce the next speaker, François Guillemolle. But before I introduce him, I would like to emphasize his many responsibilities. He's a deputy director at IPVF, but before that, he was also deputy director at Gade. And this is what I've read down. He's also, he was also the director of NextPV. NextPV was a joint laboratory effort with the with Japan, the Tokyo University in particular. And he had a lot of fun doing that. He had a lot of fun developing a number of concepts. Obviously, he's interested in materials, perovskites, and all other new emerging materials. But he had a lot of fun developing these concepts pertaining to the interaction between light and matter and different kinds of cells with uh, hot carriers in particular. So this is a, a gentleman who's developed a number of uh, techniques for optical spectroscopy to uh, study materials for solar cells in particular and other electronics components. In particular, he has an interest in uh, the interface surface uh, properties. And as you can well guess, things often happen at the interface. Without further ado, I'm now going to hand over to Jean-Francois. We're looking forward to hearing his presentation on uh, phosphorescence and the ultimate yield or efficiency of solar cells. Handing over to my colleague. Thank you very much, Jean-Louis. A thank you to the organizers for having invited me uh, to talk about this uh, fascinating topic on the occasion of the uh, bicentennial anniversary of uh, Bertrand's birth. So I'm going to speak in French. So So what is the link between luminescence and photovoltaics? In fact, at the time of Edmond Becquerel, it was a non-trivial action of light on materials. Anything that doesn't produce heat, we talked uh, earlier on about photovoltaic effects, uh, um, detectors and actinometers, uh, anything that produces electricity with light or could be phosphor phosphorus that produces uh, 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 energy. It could be photo photography that produces chemical changes based on light. And today, what remains uh, today of this connection? This connection is extremely important to the uh, point that it is in fact, a standard in the industry. If we take uh, silicon, and uh, uh, 95% of in solar installations use silicon. So we have a link that is made into bricks, then wafers, and then PV cells. At each stage in the process, we'll be able to look at this. And this is what is done uh, generally. The luminescent the luminescence or the intensity of the luminescence on cross sections of these uh, bricks, uh, wafers, and our little PV cells will be able to correlate the intensity of luminescence with the, uh, the performance. We can do this online um, with a quality control following an assembly line. And we can control more than one wafer per second in a production line. We can do even better. We can look at the luminescence of solar modules at the time when they are exposed to uh, sunlight in the field. You can see in this image here, you see here the spectral intensity of the luminescence in this red line. So with the commercial silicon compared to the uh, intensity reflected by sun, in normal conditions. And you can see this intensity is of a few percent. With uh, modulation techniques, uh, elaborate modulation techniques, we'll be able to extract this luminescent signal. And we can, uh, with modules that are exposed to light, we can uh, have images that are similar to those that we can produce in a laboratory and in much better controlled uh, conditions. So if we're able to do this, we can put these cameras on drones and inspect solar fields or solar farms 
and uh, to detect any uh, failures or breakdowns. It's extremely useful and precise technique, technology. So what I'm going to talk about in the rest of my presentation is the science behind this photovoltaic effect uh, and the luminescence, and to look how far we can do, go and how we can uh, understand this, and then how we can attain the ultimate uh, yield of these uh, through these processes. So, luminescence, we had an excellent presentation by uh, Hello uh, that uh, uh, is the emission of light follows excitation of photoluminescence and electroluminescence, but there are other types of luminescence that also can be obtained. You have fluorescence, fast photoluminescence, fast process. Oh, now, generally. Oh. This, the, the contribution of Becquerel was in this area. So if we look at resemblances between a luminophore and a solar cell. Now, a luminophore absorbs light. This light uh, promotes electrons at the highest level of energy. The, the image of the flipper by Daniel Lanco, this excitation will uh, move around in the material and eventually, after a certain amount of time, Either the electron will reach a, a, a level where it emits a photon or it will emit heat. In a solar cell, it's the same thing. The solar cell is a material that's going to absorb light, produce excitations, they're going to wander around and eventually um, emit light. Now, to do one thing more, we're going to be able to uh, recuperate current. These electrons can be recuperated via the electrodes and to uh, put it in an um, external circuit before bringing it back. So we're going to have two systems. We have two systems which are energy conversion systems, which are very similar. And since they're similar, they are, follow the same physical phenomenon. And there's something very interesting. When you look at the physical phenomena that are similar, you can find exact relations that link them together. Um, in 1959, uh, it was discovered that what absorbs emits for each wavelength, that the fact that a uh, material can absorb light can also emit light. So what absorbs should emit? There are all other uh, reciprocities that have been uh, revealed were revealed during the 19th century after 1859. There was uh, um, electron magnetic reciprocity. There are also links between temperature and the light that can be emitted, Max Planck, black body radiation, and there are many other relations of reciprocity between flows or fluxes of, of particles and forces. Uh, Lars Onziger, for example, in 1931. Now, in photovoltaic, there are many lists of reciprocity uh, that were studied. Uh, for example, Van Zorsbrek in 1954. And I'm going to talk about one which was uh, um, identified by Araujo. Um, the emission of photons, but also the in injection of collection of photons, we have a reciprocity between the photoelectric uh, effect and luminescent. So when you um, light up a photon, you can uh, recuperate charge carriers. Conversely, a lead is a diode. When you inject charge carriers, you recuperate photons. And these are two phenomena that resemble one another uh, hugely. So what makes a good solar cell? Well, a good photo cell absorbs light and it, it, it generates an electron that's mobile. If it's mobile enough and its life is long enough, it'll be able to uh, give rise to the, the generation of electric energy. So in terms of distance and energy levels, 
you have the photon, you'll be able to uh, the, we're going to go through the solar cell and promote uh, uh, photon electrons and the energy emitted and the excitation is very fast that's going to bring the electrons to uh, if there's a sufficient slope if these electrons lose energy they can join the lower level we'll have a third phenomenon so uh, with the, there are three loss elements over a time scales that are relatively different unused photons thermalization and uh, collection and recombination these are phenomena which are linked and we uh, recuperate the energy this model of uh, solar cell has given uh, rise to the shortly requires a model which is a rather ideal model in which they simplified uh, things they considered the energy of photons were not absorbed but when a photon was absorbed it gave rise to either an electron a mobile electron that could be collected if it wasn't collected it was given to another photon so there's one photon for an electron and so on so by simplifying uh, somewhat, we come to a description which only uh, depends on its optical properties. And we can have uh, emission or a collection. This very simple model makes it possible to give a threshold or limit, uh, a limit of yield. So you see here this curve in blue, that's the convertible power. It's roughly 30%. And most of the energy is either thermalized, if the absorption is too low. So if there's a very high energy, it's dissipated in heat. And if it isn't very high, most of it is absorbed. In the best solar cells, we're very close to this limit, to this threshold. So it means that since they are optical properties, we can understand that what determines the yield of these solar cells, we're going to be through luminescence, we finally understand how these solar cells function. Here you have, if we look on the left, you have a spectrum energy intensity of the photons and you have a photoluminescent spectrum and here it has several characteristics what we see that first it has a maximum a peak and the intensity at the peak and this is linked to the free energy per particle that is available for the photovoltaic conversion and now this is associated to the distribution of the uh, carriers, and that is the temperature. The peak itself, its position, depends on the absorption threshold of the material. And here, the part with the lower energy is associated with a certain defects in the material. So we can have access to the absorption properties of combined pro absorption uh, properties of the material. You have an element of volume that can be explained in this manner. And it is, in fact, a rewriting of uh, uh, Planck's law with uh, the terms of absorption of emission. And here, two terms, the energy activation is reduced by the excitation of the material. So the energy, the free energy, is in fact uh, the tension or the voltage, the work, and the temperature. And we see that, in fact, the luminescence and its intensity gives a uh, uh, directly link to thermodynamics. It's not just a theory, it's something that can be proven. When we look here, uh, the contact and the uh, collection grid, this cell is uh, in, in exposed uniformly to light and what we measure uh, we have a spectrum camera makes it possible to measure the spectrum at each point 
and you have here, you see it here in a logarithmic scale. Now, if we inverse this formula, we have the absorption rate and we can have access to the temperature and this free energy, which uh, can be divided by the elementary charge with the voltage. And we'd see that voltage that we extract from the solar cell is equal or very close to what can be measured electrically uh, in the same uh, condition. So we have a relationship which it functions. We can extract the energy and the possibility of conversion for each uh, solar flux. And then we can see what the characteristics of the solar cell are without any contact. And we can see what we could do with or without contact. We have access to the local yield for each point for good solar cells with a very uh, low um, rate of margin of error. So that spectral luminescence, and this is very often, you can send a, a light punch on the solar cell and collect mobile electrons, and be emitted different time frames. So we'll have a, a reduction over time. It's going to produce the spectrum, different spectra depending of intensity depending on time which are linked to the cinetics of the um, transportation we can also with cameras look at how the carriers migrate through time and emit light with a punctual excitation and see how the light is uh, diffused in space. And also it gives us another way of having access to the migration of the electrons in the solar cell, which are ne necessary uh, to be able to uh, collect, uh, uh, collect the electrons. So we have another instrument that is going to be a part of a uh, flash and so we're going to have, um, for each dot, uh, we'll have the luminescence. And by observing this uh, temporarily, we're going to see the intensity of the luminescence for the different images. We can have images that over a temporal, uh, over a time frame, we have different intensities in different times and extract parameters. With one experiment, we can extract all the parameters that are important, surface, uh, length of diffusion, range of diffusion, um, and uh, the life expectancy of the different uh, bands. If we compare this with a spectral examination of luminescence, um, for example, uh, spot uh, uh, checks, we can see the transport of photons or photon recycling. So photons can be used several times in the same cell. We can also we can do many other things too. I'm going to be rather brief because there's a lot to talk about. We can also have access to the collection probability with the work of Martin Green, for instance, uh, so how to use luminescence properties of luminescence. So the last point I would like to address is: Can we go beyond what I said? Is the the Shockley Quasar model? propose limits of conversion at 33%. And we're using all of the solar spectrum. I mean, this is because we have two mechanisms. We have a thermalizing mechanism for photons that are high energy and non-attraction for photons that aren't sufficiently energized. And we know that the best systems that have been uh, produced in and uh, in laboratory uh, reach 47%. And they were talking about multi-junction panels, and I'll explain this later. And the theoretical model, model it says we'd have much high yields, up to 87%. To achieve this, we need to have radiative, uh, high radiative efficiency and we have a whole series of solar ma materials for the amount of photons emitted um, um, uh, to be very good phosphorus um, so the yield um, as a function of the yield obtained in cells you have an excellent correlation 
and the best cells ones have the best radiative uh, yield. So this is acquired for a great number of uh, solar materials. It's envisageable to produce solar cells very high yield. And I'm going to present two approaches, one which is called multi-junction, uh, and the other one is a hot carrier solar cell. It enables to achieve this high yield, but there are other ways which could be examined with luminescence techniques, with a multi-exciting generation, uh, with up and down conversion, where we'll use photons that aren't sufficiently energized, that wouldn't be absorbed, convert them into photons that are absorbable. Com and with very energetic uh, or energized photons, we'll be able to produce much more. So if we talk about multi-junction system, it's very simple. We'll have uh, multicolor wideband radiation, which will be divided into by a prism um, into different spectral bands. The blue will be absorbed by a high uh, threshold absorption be able to have a rather high voltage and the red photons will be absorbed by a cell with another band so each spectral band can be absorbed by a cell which will be optimized for this and we can pile these different cells so the blues will absorb the blue spectrum and so forth and we can even the stick these different cells together and it can have much cheaper um, solar cells. So here you have a picture that represents these uh, cells that are piled on at one another and interconnected. Some are going to absorb the blue, others the green, uh, and others the red and infrared. These cells are integrated multi-junction cells. We can measure high yields but cannot have access to the yield of each cell and since they're in the series they are traversed by the same current and if one of them is faulty that's not going to be easy to identify. So what we can do is have these cells function and observe the luminescence of each of the cells that is part of the pileup of cells and based on this luminescence of each of these individual cells be able to, here you have um, the measurements, the intensity of photons to extract the voltage uh, for each of the cells, for, and we'll be able to uh, identify the total current, which can be, uh, so we'll break it down. And we to so each uh, spot of this solar cell, we can see how the system is functioning. And you have, for instance, here, for a multi-junction cell between two gray, uh, you have you have a collection efficiency can be measured for the different layers of that cell. Now, to go to something a little bit more exotic, we can also um, depart from the hypothesis that the carriers which are photogenerated in cells are thermalized. When it's the case, indeed, for a simple junction, single junction, the, the limit is around 33%. But we know with strong, uh, high intensity of excitation, we can have a photogenerated uh, carriers that are not thermalized, and we can have a much higher uh, yield. So we're going to produce, as is the case here, as it's illustrated, we'll have a spectrum which would resembles a GIS as a little bit uh, luminescence. If we increase the intensity, we can see that the high energy uh, uh, section uh, will be increased. And we have uh, we can measure the temperature of these uh, thermalized uh, carriers. We can set up devices where we can measure the current and we can uh, demonstrate experimentally the uh, yield of this system. And what we realize in fact is that since we have thermalized carriers, the increased energy that is recovered is analog to a thermoelectric effect. 
these carriers by cooling down are going to increase the voltage delivered by the solar cell and therefore increase the potential yield of these systems. So we can measure the effect activated by light. So this means there's the possibility to map different temperature gradients and we can measure voltage gradients with this system and uh, measure the Zeebeck bipolar effect, as you see here in the illustration. This uh, enabled us to uh, measure the thermoelectric effect. So you have here uh, uh, summarized, a uh, great many measurements can be uh, carried out thanks to luminescence. I haven't illustrated all of them because there are others. And we have uh, correlation measurements and polarization measurements. It's a, a field that is extremely active. And to sum up, I tried to show you that luminescence gives a fingerprint of photovoltaic energy conversion process. It's linked to all the different reciprocity relationships that enable us to know uh, how a, a photovoltaic uh, absorber is capable of converting the energy that it receives into photovoltaic energy, electric energy, with a special uh, resolution. Um, and how this can be resolved spatially and temporally. So there's a lot of information we can improve the uh, yield and tomorrow we'll have uh, very high yield solar cells would be the ultimate solar cells with very high yields and possibly even uh, uh, using a number of uh, uh, devices systems uh, in the future that will enable us thanks to these uh, relations of reciprocity to go even further in this process and now i would like to thank uh, the laboratory the photovoltaic laboratory uh, at IPVF um, and uh, uh, other laboratories with whom I had very interesting discussions and I'm ready to take your questions now. Thank you Jean-Francois. Uh, yes, this was very uh, exhaustive and uh, I uh, really appreciated uh, this. Uh, there's a question. Um, we often say a good semiconductor is a semiconductor that emits light. And so luminescence and absorption are indissociable. I think you've clearly demonstrated the, the, the problem of solar cells compared to a laser diode. The distribution of energy of the electrons is, uh, is uh, weak and the spectral distribution is also very weak. So we come back to the problem that Edmond Becquerel posed with the spectrum. In a single cell, the spectral distribution is very wide. And unfortunately, we recuperate the electrons with a low energy distribution. So this would deserve hours to discuss and see how we could find a new concept to recuperate these uh, thermalized carriers or uh, hot carriers and how to recycle uh, the photons. And the question that we have is one by Mohamed Sherif. And the first thing that uh, uh, was not clearly understood now the yield in, in, in the explanation of the yield limit. Is it due to the material? That was the first uh, uh, question. The second question is more specific. Um, the photoluminescence is not of the cell itself, but of the material itself. Is it linked to the cell or to the material? That is the question. Now, it sort of refers to um, uh, the nanopart uh, silver nanoparticles and uh, how this interact, uh, has an impact on absorption. These are excellent questions. Indeed, luminescence is that of the materials. Uh, 
But I'm trying to show to you that the material that absorbs is the material, through this material, it's the energy that goes into the solar cell, and it is that that it's active. The rest are passive components in the cell, uh, anti-reflection uh, layers that enable the light to penetrate within the cell, can be contact grids, or materials that make it possible to extract. Uh, they don't convert the energy, they transform it. So at the core of the machine, the motor of the solar cell is the absorber. That's where the conversion takes place. And it's this conversion process that we can look at with uh, luminescence processes, which uh, produce the image, uh, the exact image, image, or a very precise image of what's going on. This is relationship between the material and uh, there are parasite absorptions in cells, and there are, of course, other absorption phenomena. And these phenomena, we're not going to see them directly uh, via luminescence. So they're going to impact the yield of the cell indirectly. But these phenomena uh, uh, would require other, uh, uh, other techniques. Now, another aspect, I may have forgotten Uh, uh, yes, the uh, silver particles or nanoparticles. Now, that's very interesting, the uh, silver nanoparticles, because that, it was a little bit difficult to talk about this in the presentation, but it is linked to work on photography and it directly relates to what was presented by Francesco and Lucia uh, earlier on, on uh, the plasmons. And of course, Uh, the thesis that, that was done at the history of Na uh, the Museum of Natural History, and we see that they interact with light and they concentrate the energy, solar energy, and are today a subject of research which is extremely vibrant, very active uh, in solar cells. Uh, just next to IPVF, uh, we have a laboratory that's working on this, and this will be done to facilitate the collection of the photon and to improve the absorption of the photons and these solar cells will be much thinner so it can be able to use uh, smaller quantities of material we'll be able to uh, use more exotic processes um, with uh, thermalized carriers that could be greatly improved if we can use plasmons as uh, they were demonstrated in uh, previous presentations, which are also able to transfer the energy efficiently and put this system uh, in a state which is excited further. And so uh, this also relates to extreme light, what could be done with extreme light, uh, which was uh, we discussed earlier on. Thank you very much. Well, we don't have, there's another question, but we don't have much time. Uh, the question was, Emma Dulbois, can we check a uh, PV system with electroluminescence? Yes, the, what I showed you at the beginning, I don't know if, uh, we should go back to the other uh, slides, but um, uh, they will be put online so you'll be able to see them. Uh, but in the first slides that I put up, it's exactly what is done. We use photo electrophotoluminescence is used to control and to check installations. to detect, I don't think we have time to go back all the way, but it's something that could be used uh, in industry and is used in industry today. Uh, in, the field, in, in the field, in the solar farms, you could use electroluminescence and photoluminescence uh, to uh, check installations. So both are very much used. Thank you. Time to conclude the session with Lawrence Peter, if he's available, and then move on to the rest of the symposium. Perfect. Thank you very much to Jean-Louis, Laurie, and, and Jean-François. 
as you may have noticed, we're behind schedule. How far behind? Half an hour behind schedule? Okay, so this is what we suggest. We can continue the discussion, have a more general discussion later today. Uh, let's all go to lunch. Let's all go to lunch. For those of you who are on Paris time, so we apologize for being late, but we had such fascinating discussions. We hope you enjoyed them as much as I did. Uh, handing over now to our two, our two moderators, Alexandre. Alexandre will discuss the video session. It's important that you find the time by 2.30 to at least look at some of the video sessions. Thank you. So during the lunch break, feel free to check out our video testimonials. We have a number of uh, guest video testimonials available to you. You can find the link in the Q&A box. They'll be available until 2.30, so only during the lunch break. Well, actually, we'll make them available to you once the event ends. So feel free to check them out. You'll find the list on the screen, and we shall reconvene at 2.30 p.m. Enjoy lunch. <laughs>